What a privilege just to be in God's house, to worship him, and to come here. Let me say before I get started that uh, Mitchell did a, did a tremendous job last week in his message talking about the Bible and the Word of God, and uh, it was just so powerful. If you didn't get a chance to see or hear it, um, be sure to go online and, and, uh, and listen to that. It was, it was awesome. I'm very proud of him, and uh, it was an exciting message. So, so praise God. What a, what, a, what a joy, again, just to be in the presence of God and just to be in his midst. And, you know, I was thinking as we were worshiping, the, it looks like the, the world is getting darker and darker. They're, they're, they're running away from God, but the Bible says that God, God will raise up a righteous standard in the midst of ungodliness and wickedness in the church. We are the standard. We are, we are holding up the truth of what the gospel says. So, so there's nothing to be alarmed about. There's nothing to be ashamed about. We have the truth of what the gospel says. The Lord is our God. God is sovereign. He's still in charge. No matter how ungodly the wicked get, God is still on his throne. So, so the church doesn't need to be, be fearful or be afraid. Um, God's not surprised by anything that's happened, any law that's passed, any, anything that, any, any wicked scheme of the enemy with, with this abortion and all these other, other, other things that are happening. God's not surprised. God's fully in charge and he's fully in control. So um, you're in the right place. God's in charge and, um, and it's just a joy and a privilege just to be a Christian and just to, just to serve the Lord. So, so praise God. As I start uh, this morning, let me just um, ask you a question. Um, does God see what we see? Now think about that for a second. Does God see what we see? Well, yes and no. Obviously, God sees what we see. God sees everything. The Bible tells us that. There's nothing hidden from God's sight. But his perception of what we see can be 180 degrees different from the way I see things. That, that's the difference. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God is not a man. So why would we limit him to what man can or cannot do? Or why, or, or, or what man can or cannot understand? God, God is not going to do things on our terms the way we understand things or the way we see things or the way we plan things or design things. He's not a man. He's God. So God's going to operate different, differently than man does. And so he should. He's God. An example of this is in the Bible in the Old Testament. Y'all know the story of, of the nation of Israel. They were um, in Egyptian bondage. The, the Lord uh, sent Moses, the deliverer, to go to, go to Pharaoh and and to, 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 to ask Pharaoh to release the Lord's people, Pharaoh, Pharaoh denied his heart, turned hard, the Bible says, and you know the story, God did all the plagues, and finally uh, Pharaoh uh, released the nation of Israel and told them you can go, but, but Pharaoh wasn't finished. He still pursued them, even after they had left. The Bible says that Pharaoh got his uh, best men, his best chariots, and his best horses, and the Bible says they pursued the nation of Israel in the desert. But where did God lead the nation of Israel? right up against the Red Sea. Well, to man, that didn't make any sense. They, they, they were being pursued by an army, and the, and the Red Sea was there. Obviously, they were going to be trapped in between them. The nation of Israel never dreamed that God was going to part the Red Sea. I promise you, that was not something that they thought that God would do. Yet God did that. And the Bible says that God parted the Red Sea, and the nation of Israel crossed over dry ground. And as soon as the nation of Israel crossed over, the, the Egyptians said, this looks easy. We'll, we'll, follow, we'll follow them and just go right th the way they did it. As soon as the, the, the Pharaoh and his chariots and his horses got there, the Bible says the, 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 the Lord closed back the sea and all of, all of Pharaoh's army drowned. But that wasn't the way man had planned it. As a matter of fact, the, the, the nation of Israel was complaining to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? They didn't know that that's what God was going to do. So one of the most difficult things I believe for us to do is to understand that 
God does not think, act, or move the way we do. He is not bound by anyone or anything. God, God is a God of miracles. And we, we sang that song, Waymaker. What a, what a beautiful song. But a definition I pulled up for the word miracle, and there's probably plenty, plenty of them you could get, but this one I thought was appropriate. It says a miracle is an effective or an extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. Such an effect or event manifesting or considered as a work of God. By that very definition, miracles can only be performed by God. Man, there's nothing man can do to meet the criteria of that, of that definition. So consider this for a moment. Is a miracle a miracle to God? In other words, when we say God does miracles, when God, when, when God does a miracle, is that a miracle to God? I have to say no. Because God's not surprised that he can do whatever it was, the miracle was that he did. When Jesus came, the Bible says that Christ came on the earth and Christ performed miracles. But Christ was not surprised that he raised Lazarus from the dead or the lame could walk or the blind could see or the deaf could speak. That, that, wasn't, a, that wasn't a miracle to Christ, but it was a miracle to us. Why? Because we're bound. We're, we're bound by things. But that's, that's how God operates. That's how God works. So where am I going with this? So some of you, if not most of us in here, are facing a situation that needs a miracle. Specifically, a miracle in someone's life. Whether it be a son, or a daughter, or a husband, or a wife, or a brother, or a sister. There's a lot of different things that all of us in here are facing that, that we need a miracle in, but, but I want to... I, I want to focus primarily on the miracles that God wants to do in individuals and in people that we are associated with or connected with in our lives. And I, I know, I, I think all of us in here could at least raise our hand and say, I, I have at least one. I have several. I think a lot of us in here probably have more than one. So today I want to look at the conversion, and this, this has always been, to me, one of the most fascinating stories in the Bible is the, is the conversion of Saul in the New Testament. And I titled the message today, You See Saul, God Sees Paul. And this is going to be part one. I'm not really sure how many parts it's going to have, but it's going to have at least another one. If there's part one, there's got to be a part two. And, um, but the salvation of Saul... In the New Testament, I believe, is one of the greatest miracles of salvation recorded in the Bible. And God, God wants us to see what he sees. So what if God wanted to replace the fear that you had in your situation with faith? What if he wanted to replace the fear that you had in your situation with boldness and confidence that God can do a miracle in your life, that God can do a miracle in your family, in your situation. The New Testament conversion of Saul gives us hope that the message of the gospel has power, that the cross has power, not only to change Saul of Tarsus, but also your Saul. So that's what I want us to look at this morning as I read this passage and we go through this, that we, we, we look at the miracle that God performed in the life of Saul and think of, think of someone, I, I believe everybody in this room, I, I cannot imagine you not having at least one Saul in your life that needs a miracle. Th there's got to be somebody. I, like I said, I, ha I have several. But in particular, I have, I have some that are like, like close, like immediate to me. But I, I believe every one of us has a Saul in our lives. So Acts chapter 9 um, I believe, records one of the most fascinating stories in all the Bible. So we're going to read, and, um, the, the, we're going to read 19 verses. And I didn't get Joshua's permission to do this, but I think it's okay, Joshua, if I read 19 verses. He said it's all right. So praise God. Let's go ahead and look at this here. 
Acts chapter 9, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the, by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What, what an incredible story. A lot of times we look at this story just from the aspect of salvation and Saul's conversion, but to me as a believer, it gives me great hope and great encouragement, tremendous hope and a tre tremendous encouragement. And I, I could read that story over and over. The wonder-working power of the cross. See, I believe the story of Saul's conversion can become a strong anchor in our lives when we're facing our souls. When I, when I read what God did for Saul, that gives me hope and confidence that God is, in, is working in my life. For me not to lose hope, but to see the hand of God working miracles. So I want us to relate what God did for Saul of Tarsus to what he can do for our soul. So the first thing I want us to look at in this passage is that Saul's sin was never out of the reach of grace. Saul's sin was never out of God's reach of grace. See, what makes Saul's story so fascinating is not only his salvation, but the transformation from who he was. Saul was not just a sinner, though we all are sinners. Saul purposely and aggressively attacked the church. His main mission in life was to go after God's church, was to go after Christians. He was the worst of sinners, rebellious, a hater, and a murderer. In Acts chapter 8, y'all know that if you read Acts chapter 8 or the, the, uh, the story before that, uh, there was a stoning of, of uh, one of the Christian brothers named Stephen. And if you read the story there, the Bible says that Saul was there giving approval of the killing of him. So verse 8, I mean, verse 1 in chapter 8 says, and Saul approved of their killing him. That's referring to the stoning of Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Now, you've got to remind yourself, this Saul is the same Paul 
that wrote most of the books in the New Testament. This Saul is the same Paul that we quote a lot of scriptures from in the New Testament. One of them being, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Th this is the same Paul that, that wrote that scripture in Philippians. So I believe it's very important for us to remind ourselves that Paul was not always Paul. That we esteem Paul, and we do, and he, he was a mighty man of God. He was a, a gifted man of God, a, a, a powerful in the Holy Spirit, powerful in his revelation and his writings and the things that God showed him. But Paul was not always Paul. And I believe God wants us to be reminded of that. See, we, we, look, at our, we look at our need or we look at our Saul situation in our life. And again, in particular, the situation of a Saul, of a, of, of a relationship or a person that's in our lives. And we think that that person has gone too far. That, that there's no way that God's hand could ever reach them. That, that you might be thinking of someone in your mind right now, and you might be thinking, you don't even know who it is I'm talking about. You never met this person. You don't know how much they hate God. Saul hated God more. The Bible says he made it his mission to go after anyone that followed the way, which the way was the way of Christ. The, those, those who confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, those who believed that, the, that Christ was the Messiah, that, that Jesus Christ was the one who died on the cross for their sins. That way, the Bible says that, that Saul was persecuting the church. Imagine this. That would be like us if he knew this was a church. He would go find out where we lived, and the Bible says that Saul was going from house to house, arresting Christians and putting them in prison. That same Saul. So when you look at your Saul in your life, whoever, whoever that may be, you might think, well, you just don't understand. They're cold. They're hard-hearted. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. They, they don't want God. They don't want anything to do with God. Sometimes that's right where God wants them to be for God to touch them. That's right when I believe God can step in and do a miracle in their lives. See, I believe in some situations, and I, and I found this to be true, the, 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 darker, the darker a situation gets and the more desperate and dire it becomes, I believe is the closer that situation is for God to come. See, the devil tries to tell us, and we try to convince ourselves that when the situation gets that way, that, oh, no, 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 it's getting worse, and they're getting further and further away from God. But what if God was allowing that situation on deliberately to get as bad as it's getting, so when God steps in, there could be no doubt that God did a miracle in that situation, that it was God's hand that touched that situation. So don't look at your soul and think that they're, they're beyond hope. The, the, the darker the situation, the closer I believe it is for God to step in and do a miracle. See, we, we cannot lose heart. Th this is what the enemy wants us to do. The enemy wants us to look at our situations, at our souls, whatever that is, and he wants us just to give up and just to say it's hopeless. It's, it's like there's no way that, like, like even God could not touch this person. Yes, God can. Yes, God can. No one is too difficult for God to touch. We cannot look at anybody. I don't care. And look, they got, I look at the news. They got some wicked people in this world. I'm talking wicked people in this world, ungodly, wicked people in this world. And I get angry. I get angry at the things they say, the, the laws they pass, the things they want to do. But God, i got to remind myself that even that person that I consider the most wicked of wicked, even that person is not beyond God's reach of grace. That God can touch that person. So yes, it's all right. I believe they have a righteous anger. I'm not going to be happy that Gov Governor Cuomo signed a bill that said it's okay to kill a baby to, the, 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 the day the baby was going to be born. I'm not going to be happy about that. But even Governor Cuomo can be saved. God's grace can even touch him. So Saul, see, and we're going to look at this in the next couple of, the next couple of weeks. 
But Saul, see, God, God saw something else. God saw something else beyond Saul. So we can't look at our Saul's in our life and say that, that no, that, you know what, I'm just writing them off. It's, it's, it's just too difficult. There's just no way, there's just no way God can touch that person's life. That very person that you say that about is the very person God can touch, that God wants to touch. And they got, we, we got Saul sitting in here. I thought of our brother Antoine, uh, brother Antoine's uh, testimony and Ray, Ray Leckler and Joshua and Lee, and I mean, plenty of us can probably, I mean, every one of us, if you're saved, that's a miracle. If you've accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ and God has touched your life and you're born again, that's a miracle. That's just a miracle. But there's, there's like, greater, like, like greater challenges that God comes against that when, when a life's changed, I'm just like, I'm blown away. Like, I love that. I'm not glad that that person lived the way that person lived, but I am, tr I am fascinated that they once lived that way and now they're living this way. That fascinates me. And I can only point to one thing, the cross. So don't, don't say, well, God can't, or he can't, or she can't. It, it, look, I've, I've, I've thought those thoughts. That's the devil. That's the enemy coming against us. God wants us to believe that he, just like he touched Saul of Tarsus, he can touch your soul. That God can do the same thing in our lives. There's no one that is too difficult for God to touch. Saul's conversion tells us that Saul was not out of reach. Neither is your soul. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. See, we look at wickedness increasing, but the Bible knew that that's why Christ came. Christ was sent because of sin. Christ was sent because of wickedness. The Bible says, yes, yeah, sin abounds, but guess what? Grace abounds all the more. That's why grace was given for sin. For the sinner. See, Saul was not in a position to find God. See, we think that, that, that our Saul situation uh, needs to be in the right position. See, again, remember, we're looking at the way God's going to touch our Saul, the way we think he's going to do it. But God's ways are not our ways. Neither are his thoughts our thoughts. See, God, God's going to do a difference. So we, we look at Saul. Saul wasn't in a position to find God. Saul wasn't even seeking God. Saul was seeking to destroy the people of God. He was not on a path that, that, was, that was leading to God. Saul was on the road to Damascus. And I believe that road represents rebellion and sin and wickedness and hatred. So your Saul might be on the, on the Damascus road appearing as if they are going away from God. But Saul thought that he was running away from God, but he ended up running right to God. See, so you might look at your Saul and think, man, they're just so far out. They don't want God. They won't listen to me. I'm praying. I'm, I'm trying to talk to them, love them, be with them, encourage them. They don't want none of it. And we think that the whole time they're just going away from God. Guess what? They might be going right to God. We have to remember that what you see is not what God sees. And I, I've told people this, when they're facing situations in life, especially when it's a family member or a son or a daughter or someone close to us, and, and we just keep praying and praying for them, and we don't, we don't see a change, and we think God's not listening, that, that my prayers are just hitting the ceiling and bouncing back. No, God is always working. God is always moving on our behalf. When you are praying to God, God is listening to your prayers. God is working on your behalf. We can never lose hope that God can change our souls. The next thing in, 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 in Acts, it's just passage in Acts chapter 9, it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. 
Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. The next thing we need to see here is Saul was changed suddenly by the light of the world. Saul was changed suddenly by the light of the world. See, all of us, when we're facing difficult situations, we, we are asking God to help, but as we're asking God to help us, we are also telling God how he's going to do it. I do that. I say, God, I need your help in this situation, and oh, by the way, here's how, here's how you can do it. And I can tell you, and a lot of you probably can testify to this, in my life as a Christian, almost every time I prayed that prayer, God answered the prayer, but not in the way I thought he was going to answer the prayer. How many can testify to that? It's unbelievable. It's almost every time. Yes, God answered the prayer, but it, and sometimes I have to remind myself what God did because I kept thinking he was going to do it the way I thought he was going to do it. So i got to remind myself God did it a different way. See, we're thinking if we can just get, get them to church or get them to a Christian seminar or listen to a, go to a revival service or if they would just listen to this message or listen to this preacher, then they would see the Lord. We think that's what it would take. See, I feel very certain. Think about this, these Christians in, in Damascus. They knew Saul was coming. Ananias told the Lord that. He, he said, I've heard this man was coming to arrest, to arrest Christians. The Christians knew who Saul was and knew he was coming. And I can promise you, they never imagined that God would touch him before he got to Damascus. They were planning for him to come. That was not the way that they had planned. And I got to think that they were probably not praying for Saul's salvation. They were probably praying for Saul's death. I got to believe that. They never once imagined God would do that. But look what the Bible says, and this, is, this, this I believe is the key part of this whole passage that we're reading here. The Bible says suddenly, suddenly the Bible says, a light, a light from heaven, the Bible says, flashed around him. So let that one word change your perspective on your soul. That God can change your situation suddenly. See, we don't look at it like that. We think this situation has, has dragged on for months, for years, for some of us maybe for decades. And we think that, that it's just no hope, there's just no way, God's just not going to work, God's never going to touch them, he's never going to change them. The Bible says suddenly. I'm telling you, God can change your situation suddenly. And God wants us to begin to proclaim that and declare that in faith, that God, you can change my soul suddenly. That I'm not going to sit here and receive the lie from the devil and the lie from all my ungodly people, uh, family members and friends around me that says they'll never change, they'll never be nothing, they'll never be that. No, the Bible says suddenly. A light from heaven. What's the light? The light is Christ. The, the, the light is the gospel. The, the light is the truth. The, the light is the revelation. The, the light is the Lord. It, it, it's the message of the gospel. The Bible says suddenly. See, was Saul, was Saul expecting this? He wasn't expecting that. Saul was dead set, I'm going to Damascus. And I got letters of approval that I can arrest people and take them back to Jerusalem and place them in prison. That's all he had in his mind. But the Bible says, suddenly. Man, get that in your spirit. S suddenly. See, some of you think this is going to take... No, suddenly, the Bible says, God stepped in. And a great light, the Bible says, shone all around him. See, Saul, Saul was on his way to Damascus to take prisoners but guess what happened? Saul became a prisoner of Christ. Think about that. He came to go get prisoners, but little did he know he was the one who was, was going to become a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That he was going to be the one that was going to be arrested. 
that Christ was going to arrest him before he even got to his destination. See, we've, we strategize, we plan, we worry, we've exhausted every possible scenario that there is to try to fix whatever Saul situation is in our life. We, we've, come, we, we, we've gone over every scenario there possibly is, everything that we think can happen. But God is sitting there all along and saying, guess what? I can change your soul suddenly. Like, like I can move like suddenly. And I can guarantee you it's going to be a way that you have not anticipated. It's going to be a way that you have not planned for it to happen. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 3, and five, 3 to 5, it says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Do you realize that the light that shone around Saul was greater than Saul's sin? The light of the gospel message that we have for this dark world is greater. Than, the Bible says the darkness cannot overcome the light. When the light, when the light of Christ comes, when, when the light of the gospel shows up, I guarantee you, your soul will be changed in, a, in an instant. It will, be a, it will be a sudden, sudden change. See, what we have to understand is, and, and, and this, I believe, is the, is the just of this, of at least this message or this, this passage, is that God, God can move and change a situation anytime and any way He pleases. In other words, that's how God operates. That, that, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. And y'all know the story of Christ and Nicodemus in the, in the New Testament in John chapter 3. But look what Jesus told him in verses 7 to 8. I don't have it on the screen there. It says, you should not be surprised. This is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Do you realize what Jesus was telling Nicodemus there? The Holy Spirit is just like the wind. C can you grab the wind? C can you control the wind? I, I can't even see the wind, but I know the wind is moving. The Bible says that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's like the wind, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is still moving. The Holy Spirit is still working, and the Holy Spirit is working in your life. God just needs you to stand firm and stand strong. Don't lose hope. That's the great story of, of Saul. Isn't it a beautiful story? See, we jump up and down. We read, the, we read all the beautiful letters that, that Paul wrote. And they're, they're, Paul, Paul wrote tremendous letters. But before there was Paul, there was Saul, a persecutor, a persecutor of the church. That Saul became the Paul that wrote all the beautiful scriptures that you and I quote and love to read. So you might want to know, how is it, what do I pray over my soul in my, situ in, in my life? How do, I, how, do, how do I pray, how do I pray over my soul in, in, in my situation? I'll tell you what I pray, I pray this. I say, God, give them a soul conversion. In other words, don't let it, look, people will get saved in this building, but I bet you a lot of us will raise your hand and say, I didn't even get saved in church. I know for Lee, it didn't happen. I don't know for Ray, Antoine, Joshua. I could tell you there's a lot of people, you could probably say it wasn't in church. So here's what I pray. I say, God, give them a Saul conversion. Like, like, like wipe them out by your Holy Spirit. Like, just go interrupt them as they're on their way to Damascus. Like, just go ahead and wipe them out. Like, it doesn't even have to be like me saying anything or the preacher saying anything, the tele television evangelist saying anything, them reading, whatever. God, just knock them upside the head with the Holy Ghost. Because I promise you, when the revelation of who God is comes from Him, comes from the Holy Spirit, it's much more powerful coming from God than it is from man. When God shows up and God steps in and touches a life, there can be no doubt it was God. Saul had no doubt knowing that what happened to him 
was the power of Christ. There was no way. So, so yeah, like I said, we fret, we, we worry, we, we strategize, we, we come up with all these schemes, all of these plans, all these things that we think we need to do to try to get them saved, to, to, to get them right, to get them to live right. And God says, God says, listen to what I can do. I can come in suddenly. I can come, the Holy Spirit, G- Jesus told Nicodemus, just like the wind blows, and you don't know where the wind comes from or where the wind goes, so is my Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit's moving. It's moving around. Just ask God to send the Holy Spirit to your situation. God, touch them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray believing that God can change them suddenly. And then the last thing we need to see is what God did for Saul, he will do for you. See, we read the Bible and we're fascinated with the things that God did and we think, well, that's, that's in the Bible. No, God's still doing those things today. God's still in the business of, of, of soul conversion today. God's still changing lives in 2019 in St. Tammany Parish, in this church. The same gospel power that was working in Acts is working here today. The power, the power of the cross has not been diminished. The power of the blood of the cross still has the power to change a person's life. All we need to do is trust the Lord and stand on the promises of His Word. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. How many of y'all believe that? Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Jeremiah 32, 27. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? God declared that himself. In other words, God, God is saying that himself. I am, I am the Lord, like, like I'm God. Like I created you and all the universe, things seen and things, things unseen. Is there anything too difficult for God? Luke 18, 27, Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. See, you gotta start, you gotta start declaring the promises of what the word of God says over your situation. You gotta start declaring what the truth of, uh, of the word says. And yes, I know it might look like your situation is getting more desperate and more darker, but I am still standing on what God says. This is what God says. And then we can be anxious for nothing. In Philippians 4 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul wrote that. To be anxious for nothing, but to pray about everything. And then the third thing we need to see is the battle is not yours. See, the devil and you have gotten together and convinced each other that you were the only one fighting your battle. The battle was not yours. Second Chronicles chapter 20 says, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, All of you who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle that you face, the Saul in your life, is not your battle to fight, it's God's. It was not ever intended for you and I to fight the battle. God's God's fighting the battle for us. All he needs to do is for us to stand on the promises of what the Word of God says. And believe. See, think about this. God, you, some, some of you in here, you've been facing a Saul situation for decades. I'm talking decades. And the devil has tried to convince us, just stop and give up. It's no use. They're gone. It's too late. It's too hard. It's too difficult. God can't touch them. But God is here to tell you this morning that God can change that situation suddenly. Like God can come in suddenly. And I'm believing that I'm going to get a phone call from somebody in here. Somebody's going to call me up and say, I just want to let you know that God changed my soul suddenly. I'm believing that. I'm believing that in Jesus' name. Because that's what the Word of God says. God's not a respecter of persons. See, and sometimes we forget what God's done for us. 
We look at someone out there and we say, man, they, they hate God. They don't want God. They, they rebellious. They, they, all these things, they hate, they hate, they hate. But you forget, what did God do for you? Look what God did for you. We got people in, at our church in Shelmet before Katrina. They had, they had, there was a husband of a, of a wife that was going to that church, and he said, he said, I, he said, I will never step foot in that church. I'll never. He ended up becoming a leader in that church. Don't ever say God can't. Don't, don't ever say never. God can. So it's time for us to kind of like rise up a little bit, like, like not in arrogance, but like in boldness and confidence in who we are in Christ and begin to declare that God can. That God can. This is New Testament. This is after the ascension of Christ. The, bo- the book of Acts, for all practical purposes, we are living in the book of Acts. We are, we are an extension of the book of Acts. Everything that God did in the book of Acts, God can and is doing today. So yes, Saul's conversion was extraordinary. But God can still do extraordinary conversions today. I believe it. I'm standing on it. I'm not, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be worried. I'm not going to be fearful. I'm going to stand on what God says. And, and we're going to look at the rest of that passage in the next week or two. But isn't that so amazing? But, but Saul, Saul was on his way with letters of approval to go to, the, and the Bible says, as he neared Damascus. He wasn't even at his destination yet, the Bible says. And suddenly... I'm talking suddenly, the Bible says, and Saul was knocked to the ground. The Bible says the light was so bright. It wasn't a light, none of these lights. It was the light from heaven, a light that no man has probably ever seen before. The Bible says Saul got up. He was blind, but God touched him. God, God, God wiped him out. The Holy Spirit wiped him out. God, God can do that for us. He can do that for your soul. So stand up to your feet, and we're going to, we're going to pray here. I'm going to ask Ray, um, you're not going to have Mitchell, but can you do Waymaker without Mitchell? See that? Ray just worked the miracle. <laughs> That's amazing. We're going to play the drums without a drummer. Praise God. Y'all can just start playing whenever you're ready. So praise God. I, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to have an invitation for y'all to come up again. I, I can't imagine everybody in this room not having at least one soul, especially if you're a parent. Now, if you're a parent, look, we all got a soul. You got a brother, you got a sister, a mother, a father. There's somebody close to you that you've looked at their life and you basically said, there ain't no way. I'm just telling you, there ain't no way. And God's in heaven saying there is a way. Look what I did to Saul. I can do it for you. So, praise God. I'm just going to ask everybody just to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. You might be listening to this message and you might be thinking to yourself, and in one way or another, you may be thinking, you know, maybe I'm that Saul. Maybe I'm I'm running from the Lord. I'm not really with God. I'm not really where I need to be. And you know, you're not a murderer. You're not a you're not a persecutor. But, but, but in the same respect, you're not, you're not where you need to be. Well, God's made a way for you. It's called the cross. And God's made it very simple for us. All we have to do is just, the Bible says, confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. So it's just a simple prayer, just acknowledging that Christ is Lord and that you invite him into your life and you surrender and you just tell God I want I want you to take over so with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed if that's you this morning and you just want me to pray with you say I just you know I want you to pray just encourage me today will you pray with me before I leave I'd love to pray with you before you leave just slip your hand up for just a second so I can recognize who you are and say would you just pray with me praise God God. Well, I'm going to ask those of you who are here, you got a Saul in your life. I'm going to ask you to come forward and God wants you to take, 
He wants you to surrender your soul to the Lord. That's what God wants us to do. It's like, there's enough fretting, there's enough strategizing, there's enough scheming, there's enough planning. God is just basically saying, the battle is not yours, it belongs to the Lord. Just lay your soul at the feet of the Lord and let's begin to see God do miracles in our lives. So, you got a situation like that, just step forward right here and I'm going to ask Lee and uh, Pastor Mitchell to come up. Just begin to make your way forward. Just make a line all the way, all the way across the front here. See, this is a demonstration of faith. You're demonstrating faith by coming forward because you're telling God, God, I believe, I believe, that you can change my soul just like you changed that soul. And it can happen suddenly. So praise God. Let's just uh split up and just just, just we're just gonna take a moment, we're gonna lay hands, and we're gonna believe that God, that God is gonna touch. If you if you want to, if you wanna share the name or call the name out when we're praying, you can. You don't have to do that. Uh, but whoever it is, but but we're just gonna what we're doing. We're agreeing with you. We're, we're coming in agreement that the same power that touched Saul is gonna touch your soul. That that situation is not too dark. That God cannot reach your situation. So so praise God. As Ray and them play that song, we're just gonna we're just gonna lay hands and just pray pray with y'all.